Hi, my name is Sam Sandoval. I'm a faculty and extension specialist at the University of California, Davis. And today I would like to talk to you about scientists and decision-making process. So um, this is the, the outline of today. So I'm, we're gonna be, I'm gonna be sharing with you a couple of experience, one in Pajaro Valley, California, a successful or what I will define as a, as a successful process and also in the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo. Um, a process that I call done successful. And then we're going to be analyzing um, what is a decision making process, some of the role of scientists during the decision making process, and some of the lessons learned. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, as you can see here, this is Pajaro Valley. And pretty much uh, Pajaro Valley is located in this, uh, along the Monterey Bay, exactly in the middle of uh, Monterey Bay. Um, this is a project that I, it was uh, actually the first project that I started working when I came to California. And basically this is, this is how it looks. It looks like a, a strawberries fields forever. Uh, Watsonville is the capital of strawberries. And as you can see here, I mean, you can see fields forever. Um, down here, you can actually see the ocean and Monterey Bay. It is a, it is a beautiful place. It's a beautiful part of California. Uh, they not only uh, grow any type of berries, uh, they also grow um, vegetables, in this case, uh, lettuce, um, ornamental, ornamental flowers. So there are plenty of nurseries that they are uh, growing ornamental flowers, um, very beautiful. And in this case, uh, uh, some <clears throat> uh, John Icecamp who actually grows uh, blackberries and raspberries. Something that is interesting, and this was 2011, as you can see here, there was already a manometer, but also a flow meter uh, on the well that he was using. So um, there was a, there was good information about water use data in here. Um, right in the uh, in the back, that's uh, uh, some apple, an apple orchard. So what happened in Pajaro Valley? So um, basically, without any much of a groundwater use, the groundwater level should be above the seawater level. As people start, or as we start uh, using water from the ground, the water table of the groundwater will drop, and you're going to start having some seawater intrusion. This will start moving inland. So <clears throat> this is in 1951. So this is the extent that uh, yellow, this yellow uh, region is the extent of seawater intrusion in Pajaro Valley. This is in 1966. This will be 1998. This is 2005. And currently, I mean, as you can see, it's it's almost all over. It's like two or three miles uh, moving inland from, from the bay. So there is a lot of, because of a uh, groundwater uh, overdraft, over exploitation of groundwater, seawater has moved into, uh, into the coastal zone under the, all this this area. And something interesting that this uh, uh, that uh, we're doing in this area is having this treatment plan, this treatment facility that later is put it together with this recycle facility. So water, treated water from the city of Watsonville is reused through these recycle uh, facilities and pipes uh, to, to grow a uh, food, to grow strawberries and all the area in the coastal zone. Um, this is how it looks. This is a, a turnout from an irrigated a, a pipe. And this, what you're seeing here, these are all the different pipes that are around this coastal area where growers can actually take water, recycle water, buy recycled water from a Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency. In addition, this agency, what it's doing is they have these uh, infiltration basins. It's, it's a recharge, uh, aquifer recharge facility. Basically, uh, in this slough that is called Harkin Slough, they installed some wells, uh, some pumps, and actually, so they are pumping water from the slough, and then they have pipes that go all the way to this recharge basin, which is how it looks like this. This will be uh, the size of a three football size, and basically what they are doing is just letting the water here uh, rest, and it will infiltrate slowly but surely. And something that, that you should know is that in this area, basically there is a, a it is it has been divided in two zones, coastal and inland. And as you're seeing here, 
this part it is uh, so this is highway one and the area to the west of highway one is considered the coastal zone and this will be the inland zone something that is interesting is that you can see here the different uh, mosaic of uh, land which will go from these red strawberries then the green one will be vegetable some of these kind of light green will be fallow um, all the way over here we'll start having all the cane berries which is pretty much raspberry and blackberries um, other orchards typically these orchards are apple orchards and very few vines um, so <clears throat> again this is in 2011 i received an email saying that um, uh, from this person kirk smith and they is pretty much explaining me the situation of pajaro valley and the pajaro valley aquifer and that they're they are thinking that they are uh, an overdraft of the 12 to 14 thousand acre feet and this is the amount of water that they are extracting and basically he asked me if it is possible to conserve 5,000 acre feet per year um so basically after reading this um, i reply this email and tell them well what i saw when i arrived there it's what what you're seeing in this picture so that sometimes we have very well water pavement but not necessarily all of it going into the in, into the fields so i thought that there was an opportunity to save water again you can see a very well water um, a pavement and outside of the agricultural production area so basically i came up with some conceptual solutions that included some estimating the water use and what could be some water savings and also some economic analysis that that's what you're seeing here so what did i did well basically this this is kind of the main idea and this is back in 2011 and, and they already have all these wells every point that you're seeing here is a well and associated with that well there was a well meter so i knew what how much water was um, extracted they call it well productions but it's how much uh, water was extracted from the ground also i have the land use so if i divided the water over the land use i will get the volume of water that was applied over that specific uh, uh, unit of land the other part of the puzzle was a uh, evapotranspiration uh, and i have very good colleagues there michael can and others that they actually um, <clears throat> uh, have already estimated what is the evapotranspiration how different crops how much water different uh, crops use uh, here and that's the other part of the puzzle then the last part is something that i do is i did growers interviews and basically i did those to uh, corroborate to double check the numbers that i had from the applied water and also to estimate the economic value of the different uh, crops in this area so for the first part of the puzzle basically what i did is uh, i had two years and out of those two years one that is considered normal and the other one that was considered wet I did the exactly same the exact same calculation. I just uh, uh, divided the amount of water that it was used in a certain area over the specific uh, over the area, and estimated the applied water in these two different years. This is how it looked for in 2009 and a normal year and uh, 2011 in a wet year. How does it look water applied for? lettuce celery zucchini which it was between 2.2 to 2.7 uh, acre feet per acre strawberries 2.4 uh, raspberries blackberries 2 to 3 2.3 and uh, these blueberries and artichokes i was able to estimate this data through growers interview and finally uh, apple orchards and nurseries uh, flower uh, ornamental flower facilities so Basically what you're seeing here, this is for 2009, uh, normal year. What will be the ET value? So this is uh, estimated from Michael Cannon, basically how much water should be, how much water the plant needed to, to grow adequately without any stress. And as you can see, some vegetable growers, they were using more water than what it was required by the ET and vice versa. Some of them, they were actually using less water. So you can see that this happened for, for every different crop. What I wanted to estimate is if we move all these growers that are over applying water through this line to the evaporation uh, target, 
how much water can we save because of that? So by doing that analysis, again in 2009, I was able to estimate that water savings in the coastal area it will be about 17, 1800. And this will be in the um, that will be in the coastal and in the inland area it will be about 3300 uh, uh, acre feet. So in total about 5100 acre feet per year, 5.1 thousand acre feet and 4.6. I did some sensitivity analysis. So basically this is these are the numbers that I came after being there for like uh, four or five months and doing all this analysis. This is how much water they could save. And um, something that is interesting to know is that um, this this uh, agency, Pajar Valley uh, Water Management Agency, they actually sell water. So every time that a grower is taking water, um, that water is, uh, they, they will receive a fee, a charge for actually taking that water out. So saving this amount of water will have a loss in the revenue for the water agency of about a million, a million dollars, uh, which is about... 20% uh, of their annual budget. So it was an important reduction if they decided to save water. And um, so something that it might be counterintuitive, but basically when they are saving water or they are asking growers to save water, uh, they will be reduced their income. And because of that, they were thinking actually to increase the, the water fees, the rates that they are going to charge users to, to use water. And um, so as they are planning to increase this rate, and at that moment it was it was $174, what would happen if they increase 25% of this rate or 50% or if they double the, the water fee? Um, as you can see, some of the, the growers of different crops, they invest, but they also have a different profit margin uh, for um, in, in this case, the investment to grow an acre of, of uh, vegetables, it will be uh, $6,000. Strawberries, $27,000, uh, $28,000 uh, $28, per acre. Raspberries, $23,000, and so on. What I want you to, to notice here is that the cost of water, it is actually pretty insignificant. So for nurseries, Right now, it is 1.6% of the total investment that they do in their field. What does that mean? That if they are thinking of all the expenses that they will have to, to keep running the nursery for a year, water, it only accounts for 1.6% of those expenses. And if you increase it double, it will go to pretty much a, a 3%, but 2.5%. This is the same for all of them, which is what this line this tells you, that the the amount of dollars invested or that they have to spend in water compared to the overall investment of their overall operations is very small. It's very insensitive. You can increase double or triple the amount and it will not be that that important for them, except for the vegetable growers. That they have a low, that they invest a small amount of dollars there. They also have a, a small, uh, margin of profit and they are the ones that if you increase the water price the percentage that that will that uh, uh, that extra dollars that they have to pay in comparison of what the things that they have to do it, it will be significant for them and it can actually take them out of the market so um what were the outcomes in here i presented this through a, um, a meeting um with the board members in the city council. Uh, also I presented, well, this was uh, done in conjunction with a basin management plan committee. This was to, to estimate or to pass a management plan, a basin management plan that later will be uh, implemented. It was a very participatory process. Uh, different stakeholders from the different crops and the city, they were a uh, part of this analysis. It is on a small scale. It is a, a small part of California, and in terms of a, a special scale, it's small. And I mean, the, that uh, this policy passed, uh, and it is already implemented. They are they've been trying to save water, uh, save these five thousand dollars. And it was the first time that uh, some of the estimations that I did, 
that they were actually voted and approved to be implemented. So that's that's what I would uh, uh, define as a successful uh, participation in a in a decision making process. And the other example that I want to share with you is the Rio Grande Rio Bravo Basin. And basically, in in, in this basin, I've been working now for more than uh, 15 years in here, and something that uh, I would like to highlight is that um, this is this is how the the basin look like. Uh, this is the Rio Grande. Uh, this is Mexico. This is the United States. Um, this is how the the river look like. And um, this is part of the canyons, the Santa Elena Canyon, and the big walls. This should be about half a mile uh, height. And um, yeah, pretty much. This is on this side of the border is Mexico. On this side is the United States. And it is a gorgeous part. This this area here is located in this portion of the basin. This is the big bend. This is where the river makes a big bend going back again north and then south. Um, yeah, this is how it looks like. It is it is a gorgeous river. This is this is a, a, the river. And yeah, I've been I've been actually there. I've been a, I've done some canoeing, rafting in this in this a river. So. What I did in this specific basin is I develop, um, I build a model, I, I evaluate different strategies, I uh, try to influence the decision making of building a regulation to operate water. In this case, it was on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande. Um, basically, what I did is I evaluated some of the actions that they were done before 2004 and then some of the actions implemented from 2004 to 2011, 2010, and then evaluate their effectiveness. Some in the upper basin, which it will be here, some in the lower basin, which it will be here. And then I propose uh, mid-term and long-term policies and also estimated the dollar amount. So, so they were able to, to see what was providing them a roadmap on what will be the, the, the actions that they should do from buying back water rights, doing some groundwater banking, providing environmental flows throughout the basin, uh, doing more extensive groundwater banking, and so on. So I think I, that's what I provided. Um, I've, uh, in this case, I mean, I presented to different farmers, uh, to different authorities uh, throughout the basin. Uh, this is a presentation that I gave that this is back in Damascus, Syria. Um, here is a presentation that, well, this is a, a field trip that we went to uh, the Rio Conchos, to Chihuahua. Uh, this will be the same. Uh, this is with the, it's a lot of the scientists and colleagues from, from both sides of the border. Um, so what was the outcome out of this? Well, yes, I, I got my PhD. I documented all the work that I did. I get a, a, an incredible critical understanding of the basic. I have very good memories, but the reality is that after doing all these analysis and after presenting all these strategies and what they should do step by step, uh, no decision was made. And, and that's what I was thinking that it, this was an unsuccessful participation in a decision making process when they were planning to thinking how, what will be the next strategies to do. Um, I continue working on that basin. This is to uh, define, to help people out uh, determine environmental flows in, in this area. So now I'm going to switch. I, pro I provide you here two different um, uh, examples. One, that it was successful. The other one, um, not so successful. And, and the idea is to provide you now more of the theoretical framework. And, and after um, getting in myself a little bit more instructed in this, this is some of the uh, theory that I can, the style that I can share with you. So in terms of a, a river basin management and a decision support system, basically we collect data. Uh, we start uh, archiving and, and processing that data. Then we're going to do some analysis. We're going to use that data and, and do some analysis to obtain information. That information is presented during the decision making process and then some decisions are made and they are implemented. And then you start all over again, measure, measuring or collecting data, processing, analysis, and so on. And this is the, the, the specific example that I'm putting is in these kind of periodic cycles when 
a group of people is uh, developing a water management plan or a plan, and then later their implementation, and again, developing a plan, implementation plan is, is the type of, of a, a decision-making process that I'm talking. Now, let me actually explain you a, what is water governance and a decision-making process. Again, we are, we're thinking that we're going to develop a plan. And in this case, you can think like the water action plan for, for the state of California or these uh, uh, water plan updates that we do every five years. And you can think that the context of California hydrology and everything, it's, it's, it's at the center. It's everything. It's, it's what you are, uh, that's the, the goal, the aim that you have. Associated with that, you have certain decision makers. And the decision makers, they would like to define strategies to implement in the future, to start kind of having all these list of ideas and what are the ideas that uh, will be uh, implemented. So they need information. And here we come scientists and, and engineers and, and we are going to provide a information to the decision makers. In, in our case, as, as a scientist, as engineers, we are always thinking about what are our tools. In this case, this tool is um, what I do is some um, water resources models. So build some water resources models that will help or that will inform decision makers to make a, a, an informed decision. But the reality is that uh, decision makers, they, they have another thing in their head. They are not only thinking about the model, but they are also thinking about their constituents, what are the people that voted for them, and what is the interest of, of the people that they are representing, the dollars, how, how much each of these strategies and the a process, how what is the cost of it, the timeline. They are thinking about what will be the, when will be the next election, what is the timeline for this to be implemented. And of course, they are thinking in the next election. Um, and how they can be reappointed or what will be their next political move. So a lot of these, so this kind of trying to define this, this, this plan, this list of strategies and so on, and how the decision makers are going to make these uh, decisions, all of this, it, it has in a framework and the framework is associated. So what are the institutions? What are the regulations? and the stakeholders and the people involved in this decision-making process. All what I'm talking to you about regulations, institution, and stakeholder involvement, the process and so on, that is called water governance. So that is the water governance of, of the basin. And the water governance in this case of California, it, is, it has also a framework and the, it, the framework, it has this kind of social, physical and environmental context. And social is the economic and political context, the specific uh, physical landscape context of California and the environmental context. So this is, this is water governance and what I will be referring also as a decision-making process. What are the specific steps, who is involved, what the regulation, institutions, and the role of scientists during this decision-making process. So again, as, as, uh, as I'm going to explain to you, uh, this, this will be kind of a debrief from a practitioner, in this case myself as a scientist, as an engineer, that I have participated in this decision-making process. So we as a scientist, we are we can have a bachelor's, a master's, a PhD. Uh, we're referred as technicians in this type of process. Um, and that's that's kind of the the job description or the job position that they call us in this in these processes, a technician. And you have to acknowledge that each of us is biased. And we're biased depending on, of, on our scholar background, uh, depending on, on, on our specific interest, if we are more kind of surface water, groundwater, water quality, environmental, agriculture, um, social sciences. And it also we're biased by our personal values. And that will be if we are more lean towards the uh, protection of the environment, lean towards the production of food, uh, economics, and so on. So that will be this part of the of the bias. Um, also, scientists can be fully involved in the process, so they can always be in these meetings and inter, uh, interacting with all the stakeholders, semi-involved. But that means that in some meetings they will be there, in some others no. They may not have that much of a, in exchange of ideas with the stakeholders, or not not involved. They just kind of 
hand it to you what you have to do you do it send it back and that will be the 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 final result what are the lessons that i learned as a scientist so that i think the most important thing is that the all the analysis that we do the models that we build are developed to inform but not to drive the outcome and what by that is that sometimes as we are very um, passionate about the things that we're doing, the analysis and so on, we would want to tell them what, what is the best outcome. And you know, the models or the analysis that we do should inform, but should not drive what is the specific outcome the, uh, this process uh, will, will be. Um, here, we have to select the right tool. And by that, I mean in the, the right analysis, sometimes we use the same analysis, same tool for different things, that's, that's not correct let the calibration go and a lot of these uh, models analysis we double check our numbers and so on and then we present and then we might be with an accuracy of 85 95 percent and then we're still trying to recalibrate to get that to the 98 or 99 and, and we, we at some point we just have to let this analysis go um, um the models uh, results are good approximations are very well informed approximations but that's what they are, approximations. They are not the whole truth. And sometimes we just get into this world of what the model says. That's, that's, that's not good. And participation, we should participate as scientists in these decision-making processes. Now, <clears throat> this is uh, of all the things that I'm discussing with you. This is, this is one of the key messages. Um, we as a scientist, we, we, we can have different roles. And uh, I think this is not nothing that, that is shared in, in academia, but that is what actually happened in reality. Sometimes we are pure scientists, meaning that we are just focusing on our research and we don't want to have any interaction with decision makers. We are publishing our, our information and hoping that someone will actually read our paper and make a decision. And that will be the, the role as a pure scientist. A science arbiter is, um, a science that it is for me kind of like a, a Wikipedia. Someone will come to you and ask you a specific questions and you will uh, respond in a specific answer. Um, and in this case, the one that is asking you is a decision maker and, and you are just being kind of this source of information, this resource for information. Uh, we can also be advocates and, and depending on the situation that can also be good. And when we seek to reduce uh, the scope of choices, um, to the decision maker. And sometimes we are seeing that, for instance, uh, we cannot continue uh, planning or doing these uh, operations of infrastructure, considering only past hydrology or past uh, uh, weather data. Why? Because we know that climate change is coming, is already here and it will be in the future. So it will be very bad for us to not to, to look at that. So in that case, we should advocate to Yes, consider the, the, the past uh, hydrology, but also uh, make sure that includes uh, climate change data. A honest broker is, is, a, is one of the roles that we can play where we analyze different alternatives and provide those results to the decision maker. So for project A, this will be the results of A. This will be project B, the results of our strategy B, the results of uh, that strategy. Strategy C, what are the results? So provide the, uh, uh, a range, the full scope of, of results and put all of that in front of the decision maker and let the decision maker figure out what is or the strategy or strategies that they want to take. How do we know when can we um, be one or the other um, uh, play the one or the other roles. So if we have consensus on the, on the strategies and there is low uncertainty, so if this is yes, and if this, um, this decision, this uh, analysis is connected to policy, we should be science arbiters. And this is actually what happened in, in Pajaro Valley. So there was a consensus on saving water in that basin. And I estimated the uncertainty, and it was between 
uh, 5,000 5,100 uh, acre feet that you can that they will be able to save to 4,600. So it was between 4,600 to 5,100 thousand acre feet per year that they can save. There was a small uncertainty and the participants on the basin management plan and so on, they wanted to save water. They wanted to implement a water conservation. So there was consensus, there was low uncertainty, and it was connected to policy, to someone making a decision. I didn't know at that moment, I just participated as a science arbiter. And you know what? It, it worked. Uh, sometimes I, I also do some research that it is just as a pure scientist and some of that has been picked up by some uh, decision makers, some not. So that's when it's not collected to policy science. You can keep doing, doing your job and, and producing science. Sometimes there might be either not consensus on the strategies that you want to implement or high uncertainty in the specific system. When that happen and you uh, as a scientist you want to reduce the role of the scopes then you can be an issue advocate and again i put the the example of a um, climate change it can be also in water quality sometimes you may see that there is poor water quality and and specific sanctions that will worsen the water quality so so you should reduce the scope you should not let those strategies move on because you already know that those might be bad for in this case for the water quality and people uh, ecosystems that are using that water. Sometimes there is a lot of uncertainty or, or there is not consensus and there is no clear need to reduce the scope of, of actions. And that's when I was talking to you that it's, it's good to be a honest broker. So for strategy A, these are the results of a strategy B. A strategy, uh, sorry, strategy A, results of a strategy A. Uh, strategy B, and the results, the strategy C and the results, and put that range of, of results in front of the decision makers, of the stakeholders. Make sure that that information is transparent, that is available to everyone, timely, and um, uh, also very well explained or uh, discerned, so they understand what are the consequences and let them decide. And, and as you can see here, you, you, you have different roles that you can use as, as a scientist when you are involved in a decision-making process. Um, this, is, this is super important uh, because uh, in the case of the Rio Grande, there was low consensus on, on the strategies that they want to do. There wasn't that much uh, uncertainty. Um, but I was trying to reduce the scopes. I was trying to to tell them what uh, short-term and long-term actions they should do. And the reality is that they wanted me to be more like a honest broker, more like um, this is strategy A and the outcomes of strategy B. Uh, a, a, a strategy B and these are the outcomes. So I, I, I wanted to let people what to do and, and that's, that was not correct. And that's how I see that I failed on that, on that process. Um, now let me actually talk to you about decision makers and usually they are not engineers, they are not scientists. They don't have an engineering or a scientific degree. Sometimes they are elected, not, not all the times they are uh, elected. They can be part, they can be bureaucrats that they are just doing some of their work and permanently hired. A decision maker likes to make decisions. And that's something that we should remember at all times. Because many of the times they will be, uh, we will be like, oh no, but you should do a strategy A or no, you should be implementing this. The reality is that they want to make uh, the decisions. And in some of those cases, what you should do is just kind of put the different pieces, let them realize themselves what can be a good action. And that will be it. But if you tell them what to do, if you tell your children not to climb that tree, it will climb. it. Not to date that boy and they will do it. So uh, this is exactly the same. Um, in, in, in theory, they should be accountable, but not all the times they are accountable. And that's, that is very difficult. And, and they have a political timeline and agenda. You should understand that and be aware of that. And um, so what are the lessons that I've learned from for the decision makers? I will say that 60 to 70% of them, they don't always know what they want until they see it. So it is this kind of a uh, interaction of kind of doing the analysis, understanding what are they uh, looking, what are their questions coming back, presenting results and so on. It's, it's not always a clear cut. 
So they don't always uh, know what they want until they see it. Uh, they want to be informed, not to be told what to do. And this is just reiterating what I mentioned before. They are very smart and experienced. And, and, and technically, typically we think of, of politicians or, with, or to some decision makers are like, ah, they, they don't know. Well, they do know. And they are smart and they are experienced. And you have to respect that. And they know when to pick the when to pick a battle. The ones, the good ones, they know when to pick a battle. I've seen some very good decision makers that they understand this uh, diagram that is on the left. So think of this as your own concerns, your own responsibilities as a decision maker or as an institution. You have certain responsibilities, and the people in front, other people's responsibilities, other institutions' uh, responsibilities. So if you have a high responsibility and the person in front or the person that you are working with or that is from a different institution have low responsibility, never mind, you just compete, see what are what you have to do because it is on your responsibility. Vice versa, if the other institution, the other person has high responsibility and you have on that specific topic, on that specific strategy, low responsibility, don't worry about it, just accommodate. This, this also can be applied to, to a personal life with uh, uh, partner interactions. If you have high interest and the other person have low interest, just do it. If the other person has high interest and you have low interest, just accommodate it. If there is no interest between both parties or there is low responsibilities between both parties, just avoid it. If there is high interest or high responsibility between two institutions, two people, you should collaborate. And somewhere here in the middle, you should compromise. Unfortunately, a lot of the people, they always kind of try to go to the compromise when there is all this range of uh, 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 activities of positions that you can have when, when, when picking or when defining your responsibilities and the actions that you want to do. Um, this is another important one. So in terms of um, policies and outcomes, uh, the best way to uh, understand a policy it's like a, a beam of light passing through a, a crystal prism. So see this passing, so this think of a, a specific policy. And as the policy is implemented, it will have different consequences. So the same policy will have different lights, different consequences that it will, it will come out of that policy. That will be a, 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 a way to explain how policies operate in reality. And the prism is this kind of social, political, and environmental context. For a policy to pass, you need to have uh, the window of opportunity or imagine that there is a beam of light that will pass through these different five windows. And actually the windows are, you need to have the right social conditions. Usually that comes typically with, um, uh, um, we are a reactive society. When you are in an urgency, when uh, there is a perturbation on the system. It can be a drought, it can be a hurricane. The people is very aware and they want to move, they move this, uh, poly, this window and align with a, with a policy. Economic conditions, you need to have the money there uh, to, to implement it and political conditions. Sometimes the social conditions also drag the political conditions. They drag their uh, political representatives to them. So that's basically what, what does happen. Um, and I think the, the most important part of, out of this is that uh, stakeholders, the people that you're working with uh, in this decision-making process, they don't care how much you know. They really don't care. Or some of them, they will care, but they care more. People want to know how much you care for the land that, that you are, the analysis that you're doing, the land that you are, being the steward so with that i think that's that's the presentation for today thanks uh, thank you for joining and uh, thank you for listening and um, i'll see you around